from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to a familiar passage of Scripture, Galatians, the sixth chapter, Galatians, the sixth chapter and the 14th verse. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I under the world. Just after the war, Cliff Barrows and I uh, came together. He led the singing and I did the preaching. And his wife and my wife and the four of us went to England and we lived in England during the winter of 1946 and 47. Now London was almost totally devastated. And one of the things I remember is that in all that devastation after the war and all the rubble, there stood St. Paul's Cathedral. And on top of St. Paul's was a cross. I remember when Coventry Cathedral was being built because it had been destroyed during the war. And it was nearing completion. A cross was lowered by helicopter and placed on the top. A huge 25-foot wooden cross stands above the fields of the buried horror of Belson concentration camp. A tiny cross placed there by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to conquer the peak of mountains, is buried on the snow and the ice at the summit of Mount Everest. Now you, many of you, are very religious and you have embossed upon your Bibles a cross or you wear a cross around your neck. And the thing that I want to ask you tonight is this, what does the cross mean to you? Why do all the Catholic churches and all the Protestant churches have a cross? That's the one thing we agree on is the cross. The whole Christian world looks to the cross. Why did Paul say that he gloried in it more than anything else in all the world? Paul could have gloried in his education. He was one of the most educated men of his time. He could have gloried in his religion. He was very religious. He could have gloried in his ability to speak several languages. He was fluent in several. He could have gloried in the fact that he was a Roman citizen, but he didn't. Or he could have gloried in certain things about Jesus Christ other than the cross, his spectacular, miraculous birth, born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, or the great teaching of Christ. Even today, educators say there's never been a teacher like Jesus Christ or his great social work, his compassion for the poor and the needy, his concern for the hungry and the sick, his amazing resurrection from the dead, his future glory when he's going to rule the world and his kingdom is going to come. He could have gloried in any of those things, but he said, no, I glory only in the cross. And he said, God forbid that I should glory in anything else except the cross. Why? Well, I want you to think a moment and look at that cross. It was the most cruel of all punishments because the victims sometimes would hang there for several days. It took them several days to die. And on this occasion, they were crucifying three people, two thieves, murderers, and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers entered the guardhouse and brought Jesus with the two other condemned men. They were beaten 33 times or 39 times on their bare backs with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. A crown of thorns had been put on Jesus' brow. A cross was laid upon his back. The procession started. Jerusalem was filled with a carnival-like atmosphere at that time. And the procession went through the main street so that all might see that the criminal and be warned of a similar fate if he broke the laws of Rome. A big crowd was following. Just a few of Jesus' friends were following. And Jesus became weakened by the loss of blood and he fell. And so Simon of Cyrene, an African, helped him carry the cross. The soldiers went quickly and methodically about their task of driving home the nails in his hands and the spike through his feet. The crowd mills around jeering. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. They laughed and they mocked and they made fun of him. Come down. Do just one more miracle, they said. 
but he didn't do it. He stayed there. And you know why he stayed there? Because of you. Because he loved you. Because you see, only in Jesus Christ can we find forgiveness of sins. He was bearing our sins on the cross. People ask me constantly as they write, is there any hope for me? Can Christ save me? Prostitutes, alcoholics, robbers, murderers, prisoners, people filled with racial prejudice, people who hold in their hearts anti-Semitism. Is there any hope for me? People who have done many evil things, both corporately and privately. Is there any hope for me? A bishop of a church in another country came to me one time, some years ago now, and he told me that he did not believe that he was saved. He said, I've been to theological school in England. He said, I've been a bishop now, and he told me how many years. But he said, I have so many doubts that, I'm, that my sins are forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And he said, I've come to you to ask you if you would pray for me and pray with me. And very simply, I talked to him just like he was a little child, as though he had never heard the gospel before. Tears came streaming down his face and he got on his knees and he prayed a very simple prayer, which indicates to me that you can even be a clergyman, be in the church. I know a man in St. Louis, pastor of a large church. He was converted to Christ under his own preaching. He'd never known Christ, and suddenly the Spirit of God spoke to him. I know a man here in Boston who was pastor of a church that was dying. He had a brilliant education from one of your great theological seminaries here. And his little daughter got sick, and he thought she was dying. And he said, Lord, he said, if you will raise up my daughter from now on, I'll turn to the Bible and preach nothing but the Bible and accept your word as the word of faith. And that happened. Within a year, his church was packed out. Now he's pastor of a great church in Florida. Some of you know him. Paul gloried in the cross because it is the only way of salvation. Nothing else will save the cross is the only way. There is a way, the Bible says. Oh, there, there are the ways of salvation. So we're taught by many teachers that seemeth right. But the end thereof is the way of death. There's only one way, by the cross. And that's one reason why people don't like to talk about the cross or the exclusiveness of salvation. We like to think that there are many ways. And there are many ways that people worship and there are many ways that people pray. And God does hear the prayers of all people all over the world. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be heard. But there's only one way outlined in the Bible. And I, as a minister of the gospel, must declare unto you what the apostle Peter said. There's therefore now no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, as I've already quoted, enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereof. Because narrow is the gate, and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Notice, he says, it's hard. It's not easy to follow Christ. You pay a price. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross, you cannot be my follower. You see, we would like something cheap and something easy. His demands were so high that many people refused to go with him any further. They'd go so far and then they'd turn away because he turned to a crowd one day and said, count the cost. Count the cost. If you follow me, that means that I become Lord of your life. If you follow me, that means you become my learner, my disciple, and you must 
do my commands. You've got to love your neighbors yourself if you follow me. If you follow me, you've got to be concerned about the needs of the world. If you follow me, you've got to be willing to take up the cross. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be executed. That means that you're willing to go back to your school and back to your home and back to your neighborhood and tell the people that you know Christ and let them see Christ in you. And that won't be easy. But if you'll do that, he'll be with you. He doesn't ask us to live the Christian life alone. I cannot live the Christian life. I'll be honest with you. I cannot do it. But Christ can live it through me if I will let him. And he can produce the fruit of the Spirit. He can give me a love and a joy and a peace that I'll never find anywhere in this world. He can give me the certainty of my eternal life. Now, Jesus also warned us that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name? And in your name we've cast out demons. And in your name we've done many wonderful works. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, you can go to church. You can be a good person. And maybe really never know Christ. I know many people that live moral lives that are agnostics and even atheists. There comes a point, there comes a moment sometime, somewhere when you must receive Christ into your heart. Paul gloried in the cross because it expresses the depth of sin, because it shows the love of God, because it's the only way of salvation, and fourthly, because he knew that it gave a new dynamic to life. Once you've been to the cross, you can never be the same. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, the Scripture says. You'll never be the same once you come to Christ. I remember the night I came to Christ. I stood with about three or four hundred other people, made my commitment to Christ, and while I was standing there, I felt like a fool. I started turning around and go back. A woman next to me was weeping and I didn't have any tears. I had no emotion at all except fear, afraid that, of standing in front of so many people. But I went home that night and I remember it was a moonlight night. And we lived on a farm. And I looked out across the field and across the woods. And I knew something had happened to me that night. I didn't know what, if you'd asked me the next day what had happened to me, I could not have told you. I now know. That first step was so weak and my faith was so weak and I had so many doubts. But my goodness, the transformation that began working its way into my life over a period of time was so tremendous. And it's still working. And it's still growing. And I'm still learning. And it gets better every day. And then f fifthly, fifthly, it's a motivation for service. A motivation for service. Did you see Mother Teresa? getting that award and then she won the Nobel Peace Prize two or three years ago and she's won so many awards and she said I owe it all to the cross Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize and they asked him something about it and he said it was built upon my father's evangelical preaching I know his father and I knew Martin Luther King, of course. And his father always preached the gospel and believed in the cross. And so did Martin Luther King, Jr. Do you know Christ? It's a motivation for service. What motivates you? To go out and help the hungry and the poor and the oppressed. My son spends his time, a great deal of it, in the third world helping the poor and the needy, 
going to little dispensaries and little hospitals and sending doctors to help them. And he was out on one of those boats in the China Sea helping pick up those refugees a couple of years ago. What motivates him? Why does he go to some place in Africa, or go all through New Guinea, or go through India, or Bangladesh, or some of these places to try to help? Because he loves Christ. It's Christ that motivates him. What motivates you? Or do you have any motivation at all to help others? And then Paul gloried in the cross because he knew that it guaranteed a future life. The cross was followed by the resurrection. But God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And the scripture tells us in a grand anthem in the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth. What a glorious future we have because of the cross. Some of you are watching by television. Pick up that phone and call that number that's there right now and talk to the person and tell them your need and share with them and they will talk to you and you can find Christ tonight or you can find help for your problem or your need whatever it is now what was the attitude of the crowd that was there that day Christ dying on the cross first there was the attitude of apathy sitting down they watched him there that's indifference many here this evening who are completely indifferent to what I'm saying and to the gospel the mockings the abuse and the atrocity of that ancient pagan mob were less painful to Christ than the indifference of a modern world upon which the light of the gospel has been shining all these years. Here in New England, no place in all the world has had more gospel than you've had in your past history. How many today are indifferent? Too much is given, much is required. You see, more is going to be required of you where you've had the gospel for so many years and so many Bibles and so many churches and now the television and the radio than those people in China or people in other countries that don't have the gospel as freely as we have it today. And then there's the attitude of the skeptic and the cynic and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, oh, you that destroy the temple and you build it in three days, say to yourself, come down from the cross. And there are skeptics here tonight, I know that. We've had many a skeptic come to the meeting and have his life changed. I remember the great scientist from the University of Minnesota who came. Skeptical. But three days after that service, he found Christ and became a wonderful Bible teacher on the faculty at the university. Then there's the attitude that saves. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister. And then there was the attitude of the centurion who said, truly, this is the son of the living God. My wife was born and reared in China. And in Chinese, the word come is written with three characters, each of which is a cross with a person on it. We're translating tonight in Chinese, both Mandarin and in Cantonese. The cross in all languages means come to the cross, find salvation. Come to the cross and find peace. Come to the cross and find forgiveness. Come is the invitation of the whole Bible. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and a heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to the cross. I'm asking you tonight to come to the cross. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. Christ has paid the price on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. That is the heart of what is called the good news, the gospel. The good news is that God loves you. He gave his son to die for you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you eternal life tonight. 
You don't have to wait till tomorrow, tonight. That's the good news, but you must receive it. How do you receive it? First, by repenting of sin. That means to turn, to change your thinking, to change your mind, to change your attitude, and to change your way of living. Let Christ come and be in control of your life. That's repentance. Saying to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. Forgive me. That's repentance. But then you must by faith receive him, and that word faith may trip you up. Faith means that you totally commit to Christ. Just as I'm standing on this platform and my body is committed to this platform, so you stand with your whole life and everything you have, you put on Christ. Your hope is in Him and Him alone. He becomes the one that you trust totally and completely for your salvation. There was a minister preaching on the thief on the cross once and some man yelled from the congregation and said, what about that thief on the cross? And quick as a flash, the minister said, which thief? Because you see, one died and was lost and one died and was saved. And that's the only story of deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. So you better not wait. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise you tomorrow. And Jesus said you must do it publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward publicly. You see, your coming forward doesn't actually save you. It's coming forward as a symbol of an inward decision you're making in your heart. You're coming and standing with Christ at the cross and saying by coming, I do repent of sin. I do want to change. I do want His forgiveness. I do want a new life. I'm going to ask you right now to get up out of your seat and do what we've seen thousands through New England do. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want sin forgiven. I want to know when I leave this stadium that Christ is with me and that Christ has forgiven me and that I'm going to heaven. If you have a doubt in your mind, don't you leave this stadium till you've settled it because you may never have another moment when your heart is this close to the kingdom of God. You're not here by accident. I believe you're here in the providence of God. You get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. Hundreds of you, quickly. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium. This is a very holy and sacred moment. And you be in an attitude of prayer. You can bring your friend with you. If you're with friends or relatives or you've come in one of those buses, they'll wait on you. You get up and come and make this commitment. Here in Boston, we've already seen hundreds of people. And you that are watching by television, pick up the telephone and call the person on the other end and have a talk with them. You see that number there. As these are coming forward this evening here at Nickerson Field, take time to call that phone number on your screen. Write the number down, and if the line is busy, call back. We want to help you now. watching by television can see here in Boston, Massachusetts, many hundreds of people coming to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make your commitment right where you are. Just say yes to Christ. Pick up the telephone and call that number. God bless you. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Night after night, we have seen hundreds of people respond here at Nickerson Field to commit their life to Jesus Christ. 
This is also a moment of decision for you. Make that telephone call right now by calling the number on your screen. Trained counselors are standing by ready to help you. If the lines are busy, just wait a few moments and call again. We'll be there as long as the calls keep coming in. Be sure and join us again tomorrow night for another telecast from the Boston New England Crusade and a special feature that Mr. Graham wants to present to you. Call a friend and ask them to share the program with us. Until then, Cliff Barrows here saying good night and may God richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. To you that are watching by television, this great stadium here at uh, San Jose University in the southern area of San Francisco Bay in San Jose is filled to overflowing. There are a few empty seats here and there, but if you took the people on the ground that are sitting all over the ground, it'd more than fill uh, this uh, great stadium where the Spartans play. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. To Joshua, the 24th chapter. Now, you that are watching on television are going to see a telephone number across the screen you call. Any time during this program or after the program and their counsel is standing by to talk with you about your spiritual problems and your spiritual needs. And so pick up the phone and call. If you call and it's busy, call again. Now the 24th chapter of Joshua. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now, he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God to follow him instead of these other gods. And so we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Lord? 
or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time and still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six and Joshua spoke with a mighty voice even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them and how they'd won their victories, not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength, but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings He's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure, the gods of lust and greed and hate, the gods of materialism, even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said, you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, 
They chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life you practice sin. You're born toward sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned. And we're all idolaters. Now Adam had to make a choice and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember he came to Jesus and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said, Sir, what must I do to find eternal life? And Jesus said, looked at him and loved him and said, Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Take up the cross. Follow me. The young man was grieved. He wept. He wanted Christ, but he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box <laughs> to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now, the cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it. You've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, 
For by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better, but they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers, two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8, a very shocking statement, the 44th verse. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it, but that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there's the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching and call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now, waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also, you must make yourself. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, 
and influences and there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation, this faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafla is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When he died on that cross, he forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification, just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone, forgiven, cleansed, and God no longer remembers your sins. Yes, and this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love Him and I'm going to love Him with all my heart, mind, and soul. I'm going to make Him the priority of my life. I'm going to put Him first from now on. He's going to be not only my Savior, but my Lord. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be an officer in the church, but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure. And you must be willing to repent. And secondly, by faith, receive Christ into your heart. That means you put your whole weight on Him and trust Him and Him alone. And thirdly, you follow and serve Him as His disciple and follower and obey Him. That means a big change for many of you if you make this choice. I'm going to ask you to make it now. And I'm going to ask you to do it publicly as we've seen thousands of people this week already come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. If you start from that top stand up there, it'll take you two minutes, so start now. And come and stand in front of this platform, and as you all stand here in front of the platform, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. You're making that choice by coming and standing here. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, He called publicly. 
Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life. And you that have been watching by television, pick up the telephone and call that number. There are people standing by to talk to you right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. by television can see that here in this stadium at San Jose University in California that hundreds of people are coming to make their commitment to Christ. Pick up the phone. You see on your screen, you dial that number, and if you don't get in right away, keep calling. They'll be there all evening and make your commitment to Christ over the telephone or ask the counselor to ask, answer your questions. God help you to make that commitment. And please go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's one 877